One, two, test one, two. Can you hear me okay out there? All right. Well, happy Pentecost to everybody. I'm very sorry for a little bit of a late start, uh, but are you, you're here now. We're good. We can start. All right. Uh, please prepare your hearts and your minds for worship. What time are we dealing with? I don't see my red light on. I don't know if we're... 1026. Are we live? We are? Okay, we will wait until the 10.30 hour. I apologize. I thought it was a little later than it was. Yeah, I apologize. Thank you. I offer my apology in front of all these people and our online audience as well, now that we have a red light. We will begin worship in just a few moments. You could hear a pin drop in this place. This is an introverted crowd.
Test one, two. You can hear me? All right. All righty. Well, now you're all chatty. What happened? You were quiet a minute ago. Now everybody's chatty. That's all right. Uh, Pentecost worship is uh, sometimes spo spontaneous like that. So we welcome everybody to worship on this, uh, this Pentecost Sunday. And uh, if our hearts and our minds are ready and our online audience is ready to go, uh, we're going to go right ahead. Good morning, everyone. We'd like to thank all who are joining us on our website, YouTube, Facebook, and on WCBC. We see you, and you are welcomed here. Feel free to comment, react, like, and share this video if you feel led. Welcome to worship. We are going to enjoy our wonderful children's bell choir at this time. Great job. Please rise for our call to worship. The congregation will say the line, Come, Holy Spirit. Go ahead. Come, Come Holy, Holy Spirit. Spirit. Ever living and ever loving God, we praise you for your loving presence with us. Come, Holy Spirit, take and transform our societies, that broken people find healing, that lonely people find love, that bitter people find peace, that fearful people find hope. Come, Come Holy, Holy Spirit. Spirit, take our world's leaders and governments and bring renewal, that communication can be open, that relationships between hostile people and hostile nations will evaporate that a hunger for justice addresses the hunger for food felt by so many. Come, Holy, Holy Spirit. Spirit. Fill your church, that our worship will be ever more pleasing to you, that prayers will change our minds instead of trying to get you to change yours, that our lives will make a real difference to real people in the real world. Come, Come Holy Spirit. Spirit. Fill our lives with your presence, so that more and more every day, all that we do and say and hope will be an act of worship to you and an expression of love to others. To the glory of your name, amen.
loving God in upper rooms and downtown condos, in suburban dining rooms and country churches. Your people wait and pray. Send your spirit that we may know the truth revealed in Christ and might believe he is the son of God and experience life in his name. Amen. Please remain standing for our opening hymn. It's number 420 in your hymnal, Breathe on Me, Breath of God, verses 1 through 4. Breathe on me, breath of God, fill me with life anew. may be seated. A reading from Acts chapter 2 verses 1 through 21. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly from heaven there came a sound like a rush of violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues, as the fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And as this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one of them was speaking in the native tongue, the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia. Phrygia and Pamphylia, sorry. <laughs> Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Syrian, and visitors from Rome, the Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own language, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the 11, raised his voice and addressed them, men of Judea, and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in, nine in the morning. No, 
This is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall come, shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women in those days, I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show potence in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Lord, thank you for this reading of these scriptures, the Pentecost scripture. When your spirit just decided to come down and fill the people in that upper room and Lord, they had their little Bible study group. They, they were together. They enjoyed each other's company. But Lord, it was your will to send the spirit to scatter them to the far corners of the earth to spread the gospel message. Lord, because they were obedient to you, we are here today. We thank you for their witness. We pray we can follow in their footsteps. In Jesus' name, we pray. Use me as your instrument through me or in spite of me. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen and amen. You know, uh, a lot of truth is found in children's books, and we get an opportunity to read a lot of them to our kids. And a few years ago, we read one of the better ones. And the only words in the book were blah, blah, blah. Those are the only words in the book. Now, you might wonder how somebody can write a children's book with only three words in it, and especially only those three words, blah, blah, blah. But in this book, you have to understand that it was a commentary on our, our, our political situation today because one of these characters was red and the other character was blue. One happened to be an elephant and the other a donkey. And their discourse in the book, the words never changed. But they went from being about this big to the end of the book being like this big. So one person would say to the other, blah, blah, blah. The response was in bigger letters, blah, blah, blah. To which the response over here in bigger red letters was blah, blah, blah. And at the end of the book, everybody's just going blah, 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 blah to each other. You know, in this country, on abortion, race, gun control, every issue that really matters, that's exactly what the heck we're doing. And it's almost like we're speaking different languages to each other. But today is Pentecost. Strange tongues fell on people. Weird things happened. And in order to understand what happened at Pentecost, we've got to go all the way back to the Tower of Babel and the book of Genesis to remember that story. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about the Tower of Babel than the Pentecost scripture, because to really appreciate that, you've got to understand. So, and that story, the Tower of Babel, all the way back in Genesis, things are going very well for humans. They're building, uh, they're doing very well. It's almost like God is picking a fight with them. God says, look, nothing's going to be impossible for them. We got to go down there and change this. You know, can't have that. And then we look upon that and we have to justify that. So we say, oh, I know what it was. The, Bab the, the Tower of Babel, it was their pride. They wanted to reach heaven. That was the, it was their pride. No, as you read it, it's almost like God, if we're honest, was intimidated by their ascent and wanted to pick a fight with them. And it almost seems, when you look at the Old Testament, like God sometimes acts like our beloved bipolar neighbor that puts everybody on eggshells. I'm just saying, you go further back in the book of Genesis, you got the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Why can't you eat this? Don't you need to know the difference between good and evil? It's almost like God wants to keep us ignorant and submissive. But that's not it. That's not at all it. And the Tower of Babel... God was not trying to keep humanity humble. That's not what God was trying to do. you got to understand how things were then. God created the earth. God made people. God chose Abraham and Sarah and said, I want you to be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. This is the stage that humanity is in at the time. Humankind is in. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. How are you going to do that from a tower? How are you going to do that if you're building a tower, right? Remember, and always remember this. It was true in Genesis. It was true of Abraham and Sarah. It's true of the Jewish people today. It should be true of us. 
We are blessed to be a blessing, not to hoard that blessing for ourselves. And that's the real difference between Babel and the Pentecost. At Babel, they were trying to hoard this blessing for themselves, keep it only for them. And the Pentecost story, it blew up the whole world could have it. Everybody heard it in their own language. The languages weren't confused anymore. But see, with the story in the Tower of Babel, they choose, chose not to fulfill that command. We're going to hoard this blessing for ourselves. We want to stay in one place. We want to build our city. We don't want to scatter on the face of the earth. From a security standpoint, you know, you got to say that makes a lot of sense, right? Safety and security. I'll look out for you. You look out for me. We'll avoid risk. We'll be safe. We'll avoid change. We'll hog the blessing and the ultimate gated community. Well, the construction of the Tower of Babel from that perspective seems like a great idea. But when God comes down to do a little inspection on this construction project, he determines that something's got to be done. Nothing that they propose will be impossible for them, God says. Now, stop here for a minute and ask yourself why that's a bad idea. Why is that so bad? Nothing should be impossible to them. Oh, in God's mind, this has got to stop. God confuses their language, and the project comes to a screeching halt. Now, maybe they tried to continue, but you know, when you go and you're speaking different languages, you don't know what to do. You can't accomplish anything when you're talking past each other, or you're talking a language your neighbor can't understand. You start talking past each other. Oh, my, it's just a stupid old myth. Aren't you glad we've evolved from talking past each other? Considering our context today, maybe this isn't such a stupid myth in which God gets too fickle. So what is the answer? The answer is Pentecost. True unity in the Spirit among the things that matter. You see, with the Tower of Babel, the people were unified, but around what? They were unified around their fear that they had to provide for their own safety and security. They were unified in the notion that they needed to cut themselves off from the west, rest of the world to do what they wanted to do. That's how many Christians today define unity. We're going to hold up in our towers. We're not going to engage the world. We're afraid of the world. But God's got a different definition. God's got a problem with that kind of a definition. To God, security is not found in those things. Security is found in faith in diverse community, in God alone, and certainly not in a tower built with human hands. God's answer? Get out there and meet some people. Get to know them. Accept them for who they are. Embrace the diversity of creation. Overcome your difference instead of forcing a false sense of unity and security based on your own effort. You know, when we get too entangled in finding security in the wrong things or thinking we create our own security, and we're fearful of our brothers and sisters, and we begin to speak different language and languages and talk past each other instead of to each other, that's dangerous ground, brothers and sisters, and we're on it because God's got to step in and change something. God's got to do whatever God can do to bring God's people together again. And I'm afraid in the world, if we don't soon get this message, we might be headed for another Tower of Babel. Maybe we should thank God for stopping the Tower of Babel. Maybe we should pay attention today the true answer is not to do what they were trying to do. The true answer is Pentecost. What happened to Pentecost? Well, it's kind of hard to describe, don't you think? Even Luke. Luke's a great historian. Luke tries to get things right. Luke tries to put things in the right order. Luke tries to tell you every detail. You might read something else in Matthew, Mark, or Luke that says it was a Sunday, or it was the Sabbath day. Luke's going to tell you it was the Sabbath day on the third month of this at this particular time. He's a detailed person. He wants to get it right. He's a historian. Why can't he describe what happened at Pentecost? Listen to him. He doesn't know what he's talking about. He, 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 the Board of Discipleship website says this. It says, you can't help but notice that even Luke struggle, struggles to describe the event. His words come close, but not quite. It's a sound like a rushing wind. It's tongues as of fire. It was sort of like a wind, but not quite. It was kind of like fire, but it wasn't that either. I think what Luke is telling us here, this was an event that goes beyond description, almost beyond experience. There was once an American tourist in Germany. He was afraid because he didn't speak any German, only English. 
and he's in a restaurant, and there's a waiter, and, and the American tourist sneezed, and the German waiter looked at him and said, Gesundheit. He said, oh, thank God you speak English. <laughs> so what happened at Pentecost is these passers-by, these people who had been scattered all throughout the world, heard something familiar. They heard something in their own language. They heard something that made them pause. They heard something that made them get a tune. Now, I, I don't hear so well. Most of you know that. But I also admit, in addition to that, to, like most of us, maybe, I hope some of us, selective hearing loss. Because there are some words I can hear every time. Banjo, ukulele, pizza. A variety of other words, huh? It might be blah, 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 pizza, what? There's that word that catches you, right? You hear it every time. And when you hear it, you get attuned. It's like flipping through the radio, and you hear the garble on the radio, and you hear a song you like, boom. You hear lyrics that are familiar, boom. You're Since we're, this was on the radio, you hear a preacher that's really engaging, and that radio dial stops at 103.1 at 9 a.m. You know, we long for a genuine connection. We, we long for something familiar. We long to be accepted. We long for true, not fake, but true unity. And I think that's what all this babbling and all these tongues are all about. At Pentecost, those who had been scattered long ago, now God is gathering because he needs them. He needs a unified front. The world was in much worse shape then than it is now, if you can possibly believe that. And God needed to unify God's people. Of course, some people thought they were drunk. They got accused of day drinking. And as one scholar this week I read said, if there's an alcoholic beverage that allows you to speak in foreign languages, I'm going to get me some. <laughs> We've got apps on our phone, but that's not quite the same, right? I love Peter's answer to the, the charge that you're drunk. It's only 9 a.m., he says. It's like Bill, Bishop Will Williman said. He's saying, we're not drunk yet. It's only 9 a.m. But you know, the spirit, they thought they were drunk. Can you imagine that? When was the last time the Lord asked you to do something that was so out of the ordinary that people accused you of being crazy or dr drunk or whatever? You know, when the Spirit asks you to do something that people think is crazy, what do you do? I wonder what Noah did. Oh, you know, people drove by and saw Noah. Oh, that's right, Noah. The flood. I forgot about the flood. That's why you're out there doing this multi-year construction project because there's a flood coming. I forgot. You know... Let us not forget that the apostles' sobriety was called into question. The Spirit got a hold of them so much. They were loud. They were unrestrained. But there's something we need to get on board here with, and that's true unity. That's what got them so fired up. Everybody was free to be themselves, and everybody was unified. You know, I have great hope for our world. I really do. But I honestly believe if the church doesn't stand up and be the real church and speak what it needs to speak, our society could go either way. I had great hope last, uh, two weeks ago, I went to a county park. You might remember I mentioned it in my sermon with my mother. And I thought the 80s were back. There were so many people there. Thank God for inflation. You can't afford to go nowhere else. Go to the county parks. And they're filling up again. I see this. I had a flashback to the 80s. When I was a kid in the 80s, we lived near the county park. And you could hear at any time in the summer, I'm going to cover my microphone up, people going, ow! and swinging on a tree and going out into the creek and having a great time. And there are people playing volleyball over here and picnics and people talking to each other. And you did this all summer long. But at this park in the early 90s, somebody put up a sign. The county put up a sign. These waters are unsafe for swimming. And it died. For years, you'd go there and you'd be the only person that was there. It was unused. Now, I grant you, there are sinkholes. I disagree. Those waters are not unsafe for swimming. They weren't when I was a kid. Now, I grant you that there are sinkholes. I grant you that there is cow dung in that creek because there are cows on the other side. I grant you there is a snapping turtle. If you look, you'll find them. And yes, there are potentially venomous snakes. But in the 80s, when I was a kid, <laughs> those waters were not unsafe for swimming. So it's kind of like they say in the life of Brian, other than sinkholes and cow dung and snapping turtles and venomous snakes, it's safe, right? 
But I had a great glimmer of hope when I noticed two young men, this park was full, when I noticed two young men, two young teenagers defying that sign and swimming anyhow. I loved it. I hadn't seen it in years. Nobody's been in that creek for decades that I've seen swimming. These two young men were. I hope more joined them. I tried to warn them. I tried to say there's a sign over here. I tried to get their attention. And I was going to commend them for being so brave, but you know what? By God, they were enjoying nature so much. Either that or they're teenagers and they ignored me. I don't know. They didn't pay a lick of attention to me. They kept on going. I hope and I pray it will be as it was long ago. That we'll gather in these spaces. A time will be simpler when we're not like this. We look over and from our phones, we see our neighbor. We meet new friends that might be different from us, maybe even speak a different language you might say in different ways. Our kids will get to play together. Maybe we'll be invited over for a hot dog or some watermelon and somebody else's picnic. And then maybe months or even years later after you form a relationship with that person, you say, I'll be darned. That person's a different political party than me. I'll be darned. That person has a different opinion about guns than me. I'll be darned. That person feels different from me on just about every subject, but I like him. We've gotten to know each other. We've formed a relationship. We've done something together. I hope and I pray we return to that at the same time, but there's something else that can happen too. If we don't go the way I just described, we'll just go to Walmart and buy another gun, and we'll go to that park, and if somebody disagrees with it, we'll shoot them up. Right? That's where we are now. That's where we are right now. And that's why the church needs us. That's why our country needs the church to be the true church, to not get up there and sing one song. The church, honestly, has been held up kind of in our self-built towers of security for long enough. And it's time to get out of Babel, baby. Pentecost is the building of community. It's the overcoming of differences, the making of connections. It's the building up of the body. Pentecost is about the church being the church. And you know what? Sometimes, I'm going to go back to this metaphor because I love it, sometimes it means we have to swim in the waters that are a little bit unsafe. When we wade out to be peacemakers in the world today, we're swimming in waters that have sinkholes, cow dung, snapping turtles, and potentially venomous snakes. But we've got to go back to Acts. What did God tell them in Acts? You will drink poison. You will take up snakes and they will not hurt you. That does not mean that we've got to take a road trip to Kentucky and go to a snake handling church. That simply means when you embrace risk in the name of God, God will protect you. So when we go out on this Pentecost journey, we've got to embrace a few things we are not comfortable with embracing, we have not maybe embraced before. Risk, change, and having the faith to see it through. I truly believe... The country, the church, everything points to the fact we are at this crossroads. We will help the world go in one of two ways. I pray we help them go in the way of unity. I'm going to close with this. On Pentecost, we celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit to raise the church out of hiding and out of despair and to give the church a wind at its back, a fire in its bones to encourage the church to proclaim and to live the good news of Jesus outwardly invitationally, and with courage. Come and see. Would you pray with me? Lord, I don't know what we want individually, but I, I simply know what the world needs from us. The world needs the church to be courageous. The world needs the church to take risks. The world needs for the church to be scattered for a moment and put its feet on the ground and to go out into the highways and into the byways. Lord, it's not that people today don't want to know you. It's just that they get a distorted version of you from one place or another. They become zealous for all the wrong things. Lord, this Pentecost, we're going to forego the celebration. We don't need the banners. We don't need the cantata. What we need is a change of heart. We need to happen today what happened on that first Pentecost, something we don't understand to overtake us. Tongues of fire to rest upon us, the fire in our bones to do what you would have for us to do. The world is waiting and the world needs us. In Jesus' name, give us the strength and the courage to embrace it, the work ahead. In Jesus' name, amen.
Amen. We're about to celebrate around the communion table. So if you don't have your elements, please raise your hand and an usher will bring them to you. We also have gluten-free available up front if anybody needs that. And please turn to page 13. We're going to drag out those old hymnals again. We have one. We need one here, please. Thank you very much. Please turn to page 13 in your United Methodist hymnal. Remember those? I've got to go find one myself. Here they are. All right. Of course, the congregation will respond in the bold. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and a joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn. Blessed are you, O God, who with your word and Holy Spirit created all things and called them good. In Jesus Christ, your word became flesh and dwelt among us. Through Jesus' suffering and death, you took upon yourself our sin and death and destroyed their power forever. You raised from the dead this same Jesus who now reigns with you in glory and poured upon us your Holy Spirit, making us the people of your new covenant. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts, that in the breaking of this bread and the drinking of this wine, we may know the presence of the living Christ and be renewed as the body of Christ for the world, redeemed by Christ's blood, until Christ comes in final victory. And we feast at your table forever. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Friends, it is upon me at this time to let you know in the United Methodist Church, all are welcome at the communion table. The good, the bad, the ugly, everybody, everybody is welcome. You don't have to be at a certain level of holiness. You don't have to feel like you're worthy. It's the blood of Christ which makes you worthy. Boldly receive these elements. The body of Christ broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Take ye and eat. The blood of Christ shed for you. Take ye and drink. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> We've actually got a lot of things to celebrate today. We do have a prayer quilt, so please don't forget to come up and tie a knot and say a prayer on your way out today. I know we've got a lot of things to celebrate. A couple of things I was told about. Uh, I've, he's not here today, but uh, I'm told to give a shout out, birthday shout out to Dr. Artie Travis. His birthday was last week. So Artie usually sits in the back there. But we'll wish him a very happy birthday. I know he works with some of you up at Prosperg State University. And also, I have been bested, and I have been bested in a big way 
we have a track star in the room, and uh, he, he went to States this, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I guess, at this point, and this person, we're going to vote on who you think it is in just a moment, was able to run the 1600, that is the one mile, in four minutes and 23 seconds. And he's challenged anybody to a race today who'd like to take him on. <laughs> What's that? Yeah, you can use your car, sure. <laughs> Garrett Ferguson back here, one of our accolades. Garrett, stand up and let him, yeah. Quite an accomplishment. That's awesome. Very good, very good. Very proud of you. And set a school record with that, I might add. Is that right? There you go. Uh, anything else to celebrate today? Luke and Anna, they're, they're talking about it. A few among us got married last week, right? That's all that happened. Sign the next, how old, you guys are young. Sign the next 60 years away, no big deal. So Luke and Erica were married last week. Give them a hand. And uh, we went to the wedding. Obviously, I appeared here on video last week and not in person. And that's because in addition to going to the wedding, I was able to take, uh, sneak my wife away for a 15th anniversary celebration, which happens uh, later this month. The 16th of June is our anniversary. <laughs> Remember that. So, and we put all the kids with her parents, and we just had the first time since Frederick was born, uh, she was pregnant with Frederick, that we got away uh, by ourselves. It was a lovely time. Anything else to celebrate? Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. 38. 38 with him. All right. 38. Yes, ma'am. Wow. Ah. Oh. We keep outdoing each other. We keep we keep outdoing each other. That's great. Anything else? All right. Very good. Well, listen. Now we're going to go before God with those concerns which are upon our heart. You feel free during this time of prayer. Call out any name you want. The Lord will definitely hear you. We also have some things up here to uh, help you guide your prayers during this time of silent prayer. Feel free to uh, call out any name you wish. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Lord, what a world, whirlwind world we truly live in. We just heard this congregation and the wonderful things we have to celebrate. And also, Lord, uh, those who need a touch from you. Lord, we can experience joy and sorrow within the same hour. But Lord, in the good times and the bad, you're still God. You're the one who makes the valleys high and the mountains low to make our way easy. Your burden is light. And Lord, we give our cares to you this morning, knowing that you care for us. And as we pray for all of these needs, we give you thanks for all of these wonderful deeds that you've done among us. We also don't forget, especially and always, to pray for our civic leaders and our church leaders. For Ray, Ben, Chris, David, Jason, Mike, Larry, Joe, Kamala, and for John and Latrell. Lord, for whatever reason, these are the individuals that you have put over us and Lord, 
We can do nothing but to pray for them. We pray that they would commit their hearts to you. We pray that they would turn their lives to you. If necessary, we pray that they would repent. And Lord, we simply pray that the world would be controlled, not by the influences which seek to build people up and give them a name, but by your Holy Spirit of God. In Jesus' name we pray, praying this prayer, our Lord Jesus Christ himself taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. And at this time, we receive the morning tithe and offering, again, online or send us a check, whatever you like, the 565 National Highway. I think we have the adult bell choir, and Todd is sweating. God of wind and fire, breathe your Holy Spirit over us again this day. Help us to better hear one another and untangle the differences we have allowed to divide us. 
May your spirit give us the power to be the church you had hoped we would be, one body, one people, seeking to build your beloved community of justice, mercy, and hope. As we bring our tithes and offering to you this day, set us on fire once again. Fill us with your power. In Christ we pray. Amen. Would you please stand for our closing hymn I sing praises to your name I sing praises to your name O Lord praises to your name to your name, O Lord, praises to your name, O Lord, for your name is great and greatly to be praised. I give glory to your name. Please receive this benediction. Go out into the world and labor to bring forth new life. Dream dreams, pursue visions, and speak of God's goodness in the words of those who would hear you. And may God, who breathed life into creation, be your delight. May Christ Jesus give you hope to your dreaming. And may the Holy Spirit, your advocate and supporter, set your hearts ablaze with a passion for peace. We go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of God, you are dismissed. God bless you and your love. Happy Pentecost.